Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're kicking off a brand new Let's Talk Lore series featuring Liu Yan, the Opportunist Ruler. Now, this will be a two-part special, with part one of this episode covering Liu Yan's life before becoming the governor of the Yi province, and tomorrow, part two will cover the rest of his life up until his death in 194. And the first thing that will come to mind when discussing Liu Yan, or any character with the surname Liu during the Han Dynasty, is how they are related to the emperor, as Liu was the surname of the imperial clan. And in Liu Yan's case, for him to trace his branch of the family back to the main line of the imperial bloodline, he would need to go back more than 10 generations, or all the way back to Han Jingdi, Liu Qi, or Emperor Jing, who was the sixth emperor of the Western Han Dynasty who ruled from 157 BCE to 141 BCE, or roughly 300 years prior to Liu Yan's birth. So we are talking about distant, distant relatives here. Now for many of you, I would imagine that you're probably now wondering, how does this compare to other famous Liu characters from this period? Well, interesting enough, both Liu Bei and Liu Biao also trace their lineage back to Emperor Jing, with Liu Bao actually sharing the exact same lineage as Liu Yan, as they are both descendants from Emperor Liu Qi's fourth son, the Prince of Lu, Liu Yu, while Liu Bei claims to be the descendant of Emperor Liu Qi's ninth son, the Prince of Zhongshan, Liu Sheng. So technically, all three of these men are distant distant relative to the imperial bloodline by the same degree. But that is not to say they are no close or closer relative to the emperor at this time, as we have Liu Chong, who was the great great grandson of the second emperor to the eastern Han dynasty, which is a lot closer than the western Han dynasty. And we also have people like Liu Dai and Liu Yao, who are brothers, and they are in the generation right below Liu Chong, with the lineage also tracing back to the second emperor of the Eastern Han Dynasty. Then, at the same time, in the north, you have people like Liu Yu, who can trace his lineage all the way back to the first emperor of the Eastern Han Dynasty. So they are closer relatives to the emperor, and indeed, they all had more powerful positions at the start of the Three Kingdom period, but as they fell amidst the chaos, more opportunistic distant relatives like Liu Bei and Liu Yan quickly seized upon their lineage to consolidate power and try to make a name for themselves in this chaotic time. And another interesting point here is that it is no coincidence that we have Liu Yan, Liu Biao, and Liu Bei all tracing their lineage back to Emperor Jing of the Western Han Dynasty. As during the reign of Emperor Jing, there was a series of reforms pushed by the emperor to weaken many of the princedoms formed in the founding days of the Western Han Dynasty, as these princedoms were often much larger than the confines of a single commandery as they will later become. And if we take a look at this map here, roughly all the areas in red are princedoms. So you can see that while this strategy of creating powerful princedoms might have made a lot of sense in the early days of the Western Han Dynasty as these princedoms could help suppress local rebellious forces, now by the time of the Sixth Emperor, or Emperor Jing, this vestige of the feudalism system from the Spring-Autumn period is going to weigh on the empire as a whole, as these princedoms had a share of the taxes collected in their land, and Emperor Jing wanted to end this. But of course, any action to take power back is going to be met with fierce resistance, as we have seven princedoms that would band together during this period and openly rebel in what would be known as Qi Guo Zhi Luan, or the Seven Prince Rebellion. Now, unlike the much more damaging Eight Princes Rebellion during the Jin Dynasty, this rebellion only lasted three months, as their princedoms were crushed one by one, and the end result of this rebellion was the turnover of many of these older, larger princedoms from the founding days of the Western Han Dynasty, as Emperor Liu Qi formed many smaller ones that were one commander size or two commander size as he passed them on to his sons instead. And this is why many of the Liu clans 
in the Three Kingdoms period can trace their lineage back to Emperor Jing, as all 14 of Emperor Jing's sons received princedoms under his reign. So for Liu Yan's branch in particular, even though his ancestor, Liu Yu, who was the Prince of Lu, which is located in the Shandong Peninsula over here, by the time of Liu Yan's birth, his branch have already migrated away, and they were in Jiangxia, which is much farther south. And from historical records, we don't know the exact year of Liu Yan's birth, but it should be somewhere around 130 to 140. And by all accounts, Liu Yan's particular branch was still very influential and powerful at the time of his birth, as his father, Liu Mo, was the administrator of Changsha, and his mother, Lady Huang, was the aunt to Grand Commandant Huang Lan. So naturally, Liu Yan was recommended a job in government when he came of age, as he became a minor official in Jiangxia as well. In addition to his family's connections in government and his lineage to the imperial bloodline, Liu Yan also had a great Confucian teacher, as his teacher was Zhu Tian, who would reach the height of becoming Grand Excellency under Emperor Liu Zhi, who preceded Emperor Liu Hong. And when Zhu Tian would pass away in 160, Liu Yan would follow the Confucian tradition of treating one's teacher like one's father as he would voluntarily resign from his government post in order to guard his teacher's tomb in the town of Yangcheng, just to the north of the capital of Luoyang. And it was also at this time that he opened a school in town where he would become a teacher himself to pass on his teacher's teachings to future generations. Of course, all these displays of filial piety and scholarship would get the attention of the imperial court as the office of the Grand Excellency would recommend him to become a secretary in their office. Then in the years that followed, Liu Yan would climb his way to become the mayor of Luoyang before being promoted to the prefect of the Ji province, and then finally as the administrator of Nanyang, before reaching the height of his political career as he was summoned back to the imperial court to become one of the nine ministers. And the minister position that he would take would be called Zhongzheng, or the minister of the imperial household. And this is one of the nine minister positions that is responsible for handling all grievances against the imperial bloodline. And the requirement for the person holding this position is that they must be of the imperial lineage themselves. And the reason why this position was needed was because the imperial bloodline or loyalties cannot be tried by common courts. So basically, if the loyalties themselves wanted to sue someone, or if they're getting sued by someone, they would go to Liu Yan and he would preside over the trials. Then after a long stint in this position, an older and much more experienced Liu Yan switched to a different nine minister post as he would become the minister of ceremonies. And from both of these appointments, we can infer that Liu Yan, despite his distant lineage, was quite trusted by Emperor Liu Hong, as Zhongzheng is quite an important position in regards to the imperial clan, and even the minister of ceremonies is quite an important job because they're responsible for some of the most important rituals and events held by the government. And at the same time, both of these positions also hinted at Liu Yan's craftiness and political cunning as being the judge for all imperial affairs within the household is probably one of the most difficult jobs you can ask for. Just imagine being the official mediator for all your family affairs, and then imagine one of your family members is the emperor. Well, most of the relatives who come to you with grievances or being sued themselves are more closely related to the emperor than you are. So for Liu Yan to not only serve in this post, but also serve for a long time before being transferred to another nine minister position, this definitely proves his abilities to navigate some very difficult political situations. But as we all know, Liu Yan's ambitions is not simply constrained within the confounds of the imperial court, as he would eventually become the first governor in all 400 years of Han Dynasty. And the reason behind this is because Liu Yan would be the one responsible for recommending and creating the position of governor, as before him, the Han functioned on a system of checks and balances that revolved only around two positions for regional affairs. First, we have to understand that the Han is subdivided into 13 provinces by this period, 
and within each province there are commanderies. And technically the most powerful regional official is the administrators of each commandery, as they have full administrative power within their jurisdiction, where they had complete control on personnel, legislation, military command, and was the final judge in all civil matters. And with this level of autonomy and power granted to these administrators, the emperor who resided in the capital needed eyes and ears on the ground to keep these powerful administrators in check. And that is where the prefect comes in, as in each province there was assigned one prefect, whose job is to check on the performances of all these administrators under his jurisdiction and report back to the emperor. So in essence, even though the prefect is in charge of the whole province that made up of many administrators, prefixes actually had very little power as their job was really just to supervise, observe, and report any wrongdoings. Then it was really up to the imperial court and the emperor to dish out any punishment. And most importantly, as demonstrated by the Yellow Turban Rebellion, these prefixes had really no military force under their command and were also useless in coordinating defense within the province as each administrator did not feel compelled to listen to him and often opted to simply keep their forces to defend their own commanderies as that was really their core responsibility. On top of these efficiencies, prefixes are also the most corrupt roles in the Han government, especially during this reign of Emperor Liu Hong as he had personally promoted a system of selling government titles so most prefixes paid a lot of money to get their position. Therefore, once they were on the job, they openly took bribes from all their administrators to turn a blind eye on their wrongdoings, thus effectively removing the checks and balance system put in by the emperor. So with this backdrop in place, Liu Yan approached the emperor with a suggestion that would change the course of history in the year 188, as Liu Yan proposed a new position called the governor that would have total authority over the entire province, that would supersede the powers of both administrators and prefixes, and of course, he even offered himself to become the first governor, as he would be willing to leave the comforts of the capital at his advanced age to travel south to the distant province of Jiaozhou to help the emperor out. Now, Liu Yan obviously had other motives here, as a string of rebellions, such as the Yellow Turban Rebellion in 183 and the Leung Rebellion that was still raging on in 188, had really shaken his faith in the stability of the Han Dynasty. So in essence, Liu Yan wanted to get out of capital and retire in a faraway province where he would have absolute authority. So that is the reason why Liu Yan suggested the governor system in the first place, and also the reason why he would pick such a distant province such as the Jiao province for his destination. But as we all know, Liu Yan would go on to become the first governor of the Yi province in the Shuba region out west. So to find out how that happened, please come back tomorrow as we'll conclude our Liu Yan miniseries then. So hopefully you all enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please remember to subscribe, like, and comment below to help support the channel, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye!